Hey, and welcome to the Bomb Shop on Wednesday night, Sculpting Live with the Sculpt Dude. I'm Patrick Heath, and I'm going to be showing you guys my whole workflow process tonight uh, for taking completed and finished ZBrush file sculpts and exporting them for 3D print. So um, <laughs> this is... This is a process that I've kind of cobbled together uh, from a bunch of different places and a lot of trial and error uh, over the past couple of years. And uh, I've got to say that <clears throat> there's a bunch of folks that are out there on on YouTube that I've watched that have kind of helped me out in sort of developing this process. Now, some of the stuff that you guys are going to see tonight and some of the stuff that I'm going to go over is going to be uh, my most efficient process that I have. Um, that's not the definitive process, but it's just a workflow that I've found that works well for me and in, in my environment in the shop that we've set up and, um, and with my workflow. Now, the cool thing about that is, is that if you've got 3D printing techniques or, or processes for, you know, what you do with, you know, working with your files and exporting them and getting them ready to, to print on your printer, then post that in the comments uh, or post that in the chat and we can talk about it. Um, Chamber of Miniatures, howdy. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for j jumping in, Shane. I know uh, <laughs> being over in the UK, I know it's kind of late in the evening for you and I always appreciate you, you know, stopping in and, and hanging out with us talking about sculpting and 3D printing. Uh, so tonight uh, I'm going to go ahead and open up. I've got a, a 3D file set up already and we'll go ahead and switch over there and this is a sculpt that I worked on last week uh, this is uh, the character Diane Archer and she's gonna be um, well actually she's she's already in the web store we've got uh, prints of hers available and I'm gonna go through the process of how I took this sculpt and exported it for, for print now you'll probably notice that this particular sculpt is in color um, I went and painted this model so that I could actually render out um, image passes and create art for the um, the Counterblast Jumpstart guide that we just posted over on Drive-Thru RPG and on our web store. And it's basically, it's a little, um, it's a free PDF uh, guide that uh, introduces you to the Counterblast setting for the Savage Worlds role-playing game. So this character has got Savage World stats in there that you can use uh, to, to play in your own games and to test it out and see what you think. And if you like it, you know, we got the Kickstarter thing at the at the end of the month. But um, aside from that, I, I had sculpted this model so that we could put that particular figure out and then I could use color renders and so forth of this um, to do art. Uh, actually, let me let me show you the picture that I have of that. Um, let's try, let's see, where did, where did I put that? Let's see, that's going to be in our jumpstart folder. So she is, there she is right there. Um, let's go back. No, that's not the one that I'm. Let's try to get you the higher res picture of that. Up over here. And let's see, that's going to be in here. Characters and pictures. Here she is. Yeah. Okay, so that's... That's the art that I rendered out and it. Uh, I did several passes in ZBrush with different lighting and so forth and exported that and put that together in Photoshop. So this character is, is what you'll see. Uh, so it's the painted um, 3D model with, you know, a little bit of extra lighting and so forth on it. So uh, so that's a lot of fun. That's that's not something that I normally get to do because basically like if I'm doing, you know, client work or doing commissions or whatever, I basically just doing the sculpt and sending it out. So the stuff that I'm doing, you know, for us here at Bombshell now, uh, it's really cool to, uh, to be able to kind of, uh, get in and do some poly painting and, 
and rendering and so forth and you know try out some of that end of it so that's a lot of fun i've i've enjoyed doing that so anyway we'll jump back into zbrush here and what i've this is the this is the actual sculpt file okay so i'm going to turn off the the colors and so forth and turn this base off so that's the the actual sculpt and if i go back and turn on uh, polygroups, you'll see that here's all of the individual groups for the parts. And some of the, some of these groups actually have, like if I go back and hit auto groups, you'll see that even these are, these parts are broken down into subgroups. So, um, so that's, if you watch some of our previous Sculpt and Live videos, then I kind of go through, you know, grouping those objects together to give me a better idea of, you know, how it's going to be posed, you know, it's easier for me to grab the objects and pose them and move them around than if it's like, you know, one solid mesh or whatever. So, uh, so this model, um, is right around 4.63 million points. So it's not really like super dense as far as resolution goes. Of course, it's, you know, a miniature it's, so she's about 30 millimeters taller. Well, actually, I've got a ruler in here. I can tell you exactly how tall she is. Uh, she's exactly 30 millimeters to the eye, and uh, the top of her hair, you know, comes up to about 34 millimeters. Now, this ruler object that I've got in there, that's kind of important um, because this is what we're going to use in order to tell ZBrush to export this um, mesh later on in the process, and so that we'll know that it's going to be sized correctly and how big... Uh, you know, we want that whenever it is imported into um, Mesh Mixer and um, Chittabox and so forth. So right now I'm using the Chittabox slicer. I know there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of you out there. I, I guess it's pronounced Ch Chittabox, Chittabox. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, it's the slicing software for 3D printing. And um, I know there's another popular slicer out there and and again uh, lychee or litchi or whatever i don't know what that that's called either uh, i i can put those links and stuff uh in the the description down below if you if you want to uh if you you want to check those out but um i i started using you know this particular slicer and i um i haven't had time to download the other one and and mess around with it because it's it's like most of the time that i sit down to work I want to try to get stuff done and I don't, I don't have a lot of time to experiment and do my own R and D. So I kind of rely on other people to kind of, you know, point me in the right direction and then I see what works best for me. And so far it's, it's been that. Uh, okay. So, um, w with our model here, the first thing that I'm going to do when I get ready to export this. So like at this point, I've already sculpted this and I want to keep this sculpt, intact because just like I've been able to go back to this original model, if I need, if there, if there's some kind of an error or some kind of a problem with it, I can always go back into the individual elements and, you know, resize them. Like if the, the gun's too big or too small, or like in this instance, whenever I sculpted her last week, there was a problem with the creases in the back of her pants, like where her butt is. So, uh, I had to actually go back and, and remesh all of her pants and then re-sculpt these creases and so forth in there so that they look like they do now. So because I kept this original sculpt file, I was able to go back, go into that part of it, make the changes that I needed to, and then re-export all of this again for print. So now that I've, I've printed some of them, I'm going to take this model and go back and go through that whole process again live for you now so that you can see exactly, you know, how I did that. Um, okay. So the first thing that I'll want to do is, uh, let's see, really I've been poly painting today and seeing my model in ZBrush at the moment. Who man, that's, that's a big file, Shane. <laughs> I think my computer would choke. I'm, I'm seriously behind in, in an upgrade. So I'm hoping that if our Kickstarter is, is really, really, successful <laughs> be able to upgrade some of our stuff here and it'll be easier for us to create content so yeah it's yeah I, i'm looking forward to seeing um your your king and uh decimating process and stuff on that so i'd, I'd be curious to see how you do that uh i'm i'm going to kind of show you what what i'm doing here and we'll see if that's different from what you've been doing uh okay 
So the first thing that I want to do is I want to make all of this like one mesh. So since the base is going to be a separate part, I'm, I'm not going to need that. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to delete that. I don't want to delete all of it. I'm going to delete that. And then I've got this, this is uh, my Brack Maxter sculpt. And I use that for like, sometimes for reference to see, you know, how big he's going to be and how, how tall, you know, or whatever I want the other sculpts to be just as a reference model. So I don't need that in there either. So I'm going to, I'm going to delete that. And now we're dealing with just, just the sculpt mesh. So, um, let's see, are the recent orders pre or post edits for this mini? Uh, oh yeah. All of the, all of the orders for the mini, like I fixed it before we, we, we sent out any orders. I mean, that was something, you know, that, um, that I had to fix before it went to print, you know? So, uh, I, I noticed it when I was setting the file up to print the first time. So it didn't actually go to print. It stopped at that point. And then I went back and reworked the, so there's no, there are no sculpts or actually there are no physical prints of the previous version of this. Um, cause I, I was able to fix the sculpt actually before I printed any of them. So yeah, if you've ordered this, this model, you're going to get this version of it. So, um, the, uh, the mesh that we have here, I'm going to go over here to the geometry tab and go into Dynamesh. And what Dynamesh is going to do is it's going to take all of these separate parts that we have and it's going to mesh it all together into one watertight object. Okay. And so I'm going to click on the project button because I, what it tends to do is it kind of averages some of the details a lot of times. And I don't want it to do that. I want it to actually take the original mesh parts and project it onto the new um, dynameshed object. Okay. So I'm going to select project and then I'm going to crank the resolution up to 1024. And that tends to be about just the right, the right amount of resolution. It's it usually clocks in at about, I want to say about a million points or so, which is great. It, it keeps all the detail. It doesn't generate any artifacts or uh, in any of that kind of stuff. So, or, or as much, it's not as noticeable. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the poly mesh off and then I'm going to run the Dynamesh process and it's going to run and see it's Dynameshing. It's closing any holes. It's processing mesh faces and it's going to go through its little, little menu bar thing. So, um, while it's thinking about that, um, I'm going to get a drink. <laughs> Okay, it looks like it's coming in at just under a million points. It's like 0.71 is, is what it's calculated. So that's not bad. And, and, and when you look at it, you'll see there's not really going to be, you know, any change to it at all. Uh, if you, if you remeshed this or dynameshed it rather at a lower resolution, you would see that like a lot of the crisp details and so forth in there would, would soften. It would, it would change the um, topology of, of the sculpt too much. And so it, um, it usually, it helps to, to have it a little bit higher resolution while it's thinking. Oh, also, I know we talked about in previous episodes, the, um, uh, national day of <laughs> last week, it was national peanut butter day. Today, ironically enough, is International Women's Day. And of course, uh, March here in the U.S. is also uh, Women's History Month. And so uh, just a big shout out to all of my, you know, heroes out there that are uh, great inspirations and so forth. So uh, I, I wanted to say, you know, this is a day of appreciation for you. Not that we don't appreciate you the rest of the days of the year, but particularly on this day, we wanted to shout out to you. So... Hey, Justin, thanks for jumping in. It's good to see you in the chat. I'm hoping that, uh, that we'll get a lot of, um, you know, new, new chatters and, you know, new watchers and so forth. I was able to post a link over in uh, a couple of the 
3D printing groups and stuff this week, uh, particularly since we're talking about 3D printing. So um, glad you guys could drop by and check out this the live stream. Okay, so it looks like it's finished processing all of the, the mesh and everything. Now, the poly groups are still going to be there. So uh, I'm going to hit auto groups down here. And what it'll do is that's going to tell me it's going to auto group the, the whole object. And so if it was still individual parts, auto grouping that would would turn it back to, you know, these individual parts. So, so now we know that it's all one solid watertight mesh. And you can kind of check that. I'm going to turn on the line work for it. And you can see that it's created a cross section of little bitty tiny squares all over the mesh of the the sculpt. Okay, so that's that's what we want at this point. Okay, so usually what I'll do once it gets to this stage, I'm going to turn that off so I don't remesh it because you can actually keep remeshing it by dragging the cursor. Uh, so I'm going to take this version of the file, okay, and then I'm going to go up here and go to Save As. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to export this this whole group. Uh, we'll just put it on the desktop for now. And what I'm going to I'm going to call this ready for print. Okay, so RFP. This is the Diane RFP file, and this is just going to save this version of it uh, in case I need to go back to you know, that and work on something else. So I'm going to save that out on the desktop at this point. Okay. So now, now that I've got it all one mesh, uh, we're going to decimate that because right now the file size is still way too large and way too many active points for the STL, uh, software to read it properly and, and, and all that. So so I'm going to open up this doc over here and then under the plugin section, I'm going to grab this menu and drag it over here so I don't have to keep opening and closing it. Now in this section, there's uh, a plugin called Decimation Master. And what this is going to do is this is going to kind of, um, the, the nearest thing, the nearest way that I can describe it is if you have like a big Photoshop file and you save it out as a JPEG, there's a lot of there's a lot of compression and some things that happen in it. So it loses a lot of stuff in that process. And this is kind of like that. It, it kind of goes and averages the mesh and creates just the, you know, the, the fewest amount of points that it can and still maintain the mesh integrity. Okay. So let's look at, let's look at her face right now. Okay. So you can see that after, like when you zoom in like super high, you can see, that around her eyes and around these places where the hair and so forth and the collar, these are all little, little artifacts. They're little tiny micro artifacts that it's this point don't really matter much because the figure is only 30 millimeters tall, well, 34 millimeters tall. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm still going to average this mesh and we'll go ahead and turn, turn the line work back on so we can kind of see what it's going to do. Okay. So right now, ZBrush is going to want me to process this so that it'll be it'll be able to re-average this mesh. Uh, so we want to pre-process the current file or the current subtool, and it's going to think it's this isn't going to take as long as it does to Dynamesh it. So, huh, but here's an opportunity to get some more water. Hey, stay hydrated, folks. That's an important thing. All right, so that's just about wrapped up. There we go. Okay, so it's thought about it, calculated it, and now we're gonna tell it to do it. Now, usually this is just the default settings here, which is gonna decimate it to 20% of the original volume of active points that it had. So we started out with about 717,000 points, and then uh, we're gonna decimate that and tell it I want you to process it down to look at that. It, it dropped it to 143,000 points and you can see all of the little triangles that it's created in order to average out this mesh. Okay. So I'm going to turn the lines off and you can see that at a, at a micro level, man, I wish me. Yeah. 
I'm, I gotta, I'm gonna recenter that object. So there we go. So it, it rotates like I'm expecting it to. Okay. So when you look at these surfaces, you can still see that there's this little, this little pattern, this little triangular pattern and so forth across the surface, right? But at, you know, at, at the printing level, this is going to be so small. And even when you zoom out, it's like, that's really not going to make much of a difference. At first, when I started working in ZBrush, I was really concerned that that was going to create, you know, printing artifacts and so forth. And it just doesn't, uh, not now, not with the resolution printers and stuff that, that are available, uh, 4k and 8k, you know, and so forth. Uh, so, okay. So now that we've got the, um, this part, um, remeshed into, um, triangles, what I want to do is I want to save this. Okay. So I'm going to go back up to here and I'm going to say save as, and then I'm going to name this STL. Okay. And we'll just save that out to the desktop. Okay. So now we've, we've got this file that's already meshed and, and there was one thing that I forgot to do, but I can save it back out. Okay. Usually down here in the geometry panel, there's a little tab down at the bottom called mesh integrity. And what'll happen is, is that like a lot of times in some of these little tight places where these folds of the mesh happen and intersect, it'll create print errors. So it'll come up with errors that it's like these two faces are too close together or they're folded over one another when it averages the mesh out and it creates errors that could cause problems. It could confuse the printer. It could, you know, cause some other issues. So with that in mind, uh, ZBrush has actually included this little thing. Now there's an that option in here. You can check the mesh. So if you click on that, it's going to say, hey, there's 14 edges that are shared by more than two polygons, which means that there are some of them that are folded over and creating uh, uh, an error in that. Okay, so there's just all you got to do is click fix mesh. Okay, and it says the mesh integrity test has completed. So we know, okay, well, it's found whatever it can find and fixed them. And then if you go back, it's going to say, hey, it's it's done. But, um, but I have found that after I export this model, uh, there's still going to be errors in it. And that's why when I show you what we're going to do in the next step, we can fix that. And, um, it's in a, a little piece of free software. Uh, I think it's Autodesk that puts it out. It's called mesh mixer. And there's a bunch of other cool stuff that you can do in mesh mi mesh mixer and it's free. And I'll put the link down in the description too, for that. I guess I'm going to have to go back and and remember all the stuff that, that we've covered in this to make sure that you guys get all the all the links that you need. Um, but yeah, you can check it out because you can actually kit bash STL files in it. So you can take and I've watched a couple of YouTube videos on that. I don't I don't know where they are. So that would be something that you would just have to do a search in YouTube and, and say, hey, find, you know, tutorials on Mesh Mixer. And, uh, you know, it, it there's tools in it to slide, you know, cut. I don't want to say slice because that's another thing. But you can cut models, key them, and, uh, you know, put models together and remesh them and do all of that kind of stuff. So you can really do a lot of kit bashing and stuff in that and then, you know, print out what you want to print out. Um, so, okay. So we've got her set up ready to export at this point. So what we want to do, oh, and I need to go back and save that uh, over what we did. So I'm going to go back to save as and die in STL which is this file right here, save and replace. Okay. So it's fixed whatever it thinks it can fix. Uh, so now what we want to do is we want to actually go ahead and put it out as an STL file. Uh, so I'm going to go up here to 3d print hub. Okay. And this was very confusing to me at first because it's like, I didn't quite understand how, uh, ZBrush was calculating the sizes and all this. And the file that I'm working in, I've created a grid inside of it that it's all uh, with, it's called all one millimeter grid, you know, so that I can make sure that, you know, the world space, it's all measured out and saved out so that every time that I open this file or a copy of it, I've saved a template. So every time I open it up, I know that, you know, this is all going to be the right size. 
Uh, and then each one of those template folders that I have has this ruler in it that's like a 50 millimeter ruler so that I know that it's 50 millimeters tall. If I can zoom out to see all of it. Okay, yeah, it's 50 millimeters tall, 50 millimeters wide. Okay, so the, the volume of this is going to make up a 50 millimeter cube. And so I, that way I can make sure that, you know, these models, they all match, you know, with, with one another. Um, or, for example, if I've made a whole file of nothing but weapons, like the Pulsar rifle that she's got, I have another file that also has that ruler in it that has all of the Pulsar rifles stacked up, you know, uh, at that particular size so that they're all consistent. So that if I'm sculpting in another file and I want another character to have a Pulsar rifle, I've got two options. I can either open this and drag that Pulsar rifle back over into the other file, you know, make a copy of it, or I can just go and open up the original file and copy it in. And I know that it's exactly the same size that it's going to fit and be consistent across all of the other miniatures. So let's see. Uh, Justin's talking about mesh mixer. Let's see. It's amazing. It's very sad that he's going to pull up the Oh, yeah. See, I've been using it so long. I didn't even know that it was, it, it's not supported anymore. <laughs> so, I mean, and, and basically I'm just using it to check my meshes, you know, at this point. So, and there's probably other pieces of software out there that does exactly, you know, what I use it for. But I mean, I just, I, I only do one operation with it. So, it, it kind of fits the bill for me. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to get ready to export this as an STL file. Okay. So the first thing that I want to do is update the size ratio because it kind of defaults to this like 25 millimeter height or whatever, for whatever reason. Okay. Now, before you update the size ratio in that and tell ZBrush, Hey, this is the space that I'm working in that I want you to export this model from. Okay, you need to go and make sure that you're on the object that you want it to reference. Okay, so that's why I usually put these rulers at the top of every subtool, or it's the top subtool in every tool file folder that I've got. So, uh, and it's also kind of cool because it creates kind of a null object that you can name the file name and then name all of your subnames or, or all of your subtools rather. So, uh, and I'm going to turn this weird poly mesh or uh, poly group off. Okay. So, uh, so now that I've got the ruler object selected, I'm going to select update size ratios. Okay. And it's thinking about it for some reason. There we go. Okay. So, um, and it's, it's, it's wanting the format. It's like, Hey, is this, you do want inches? Do you want millimeters or do you want, you know, weird millimeter? Okay. So I'm just going to pick this right? And it's going to set it to two and a half, but I'm going to tell it that it's actually 50 millimeters. Okay. And then when I tab through it, you can see that it's updated that 50 millimeters across all axis. So X, Y, and Z, this object is 50 millimeters. And anything that we export out in this group is going to be that size or the size that it's related to. So you can see here, she's that size. This is all gonna be that size. Okay, so now, uh, now that I've got the, uh, now that I've, I've got ZBrush set up that this is what I wanna do, I'm gonna just export the STL file. And again, we're just gonna put her on the desktop, but I don't wanna name it, you know, STL, STL. Okay, so we're just gonna call her Diane and we're just going to save it out as the STL file. Okay, so then you have these different choices and it's like, well, hey, do you want to save it as this subtool one, subtool two? Do you want it named using the subtool name as the file name? And that's fine with me. Okay, I'd rather just, you know, name it as the file name is fine. Okay, so I'm going to click on that and it says your files were successfully exported. Okay, so we're going to find out. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and we're going to pop out a ZBrush there. And um, let's see, you can still get Mesh Mixer. It's just a bit of a game to find it. Well worth it though. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's a it's a handy little piece of software for sure. Okay, and since we're talking about Mesh Mixer, here's our, here's our Diane STL file, okay? So you can see that, 
it looks pretty much just like the sculpt. It's also exported the ruler as a separate STL file. This, I, I don't need that anymore. So I'm going to move that because all of the size information is stored in this F STL file as it is. So we'll just go ahead and get rid of that. And then we'll go over to Mesh Mixer. Okay. There she is. Right. Oh, come on, it's not that big. Okay. So just Automatically, you can see that there are error points in there that ZBrush didn't catch. And that's what those little red dots are that show up. So we're going to fix those. And what I'm going to do is go up here to where am I going to? Oh, analysis, right? So I click on analysis and go to inspector. And inspector is going to find all of the hidden folds in there that may possibly create an error. Now there's three different ones of these, okay? And I don't know what they are and it doesn't really matter, okay? And it, it may matter to somebody, but like for the purpose of like what I'm doing, it just shows up as an error and I wanna get rid of it so that I know that it's not gonna confuse my 3D printer. So I'm gonna go over here to auto repair all and click on that and it's gonna process it and it's still got one error. Okay, now the mesh that I used earlier did not. So whatever reason that's still showing up in there. And it's, it's not really gonna matter at this point because what I would have to do, and this is, a, again, this is why I saved out these iterations of it. I would have to go back into ZBrush and find out what the problem with this area is right here and fix it and then re-export this model, okay? And sometimes it, it takes a couple of times. Most of the time though, whenever I'm sculpting, uh, I know to kind of look for areas that cause problems like that and smooth them out or do what I've got to do before going through the Dynamesh process and doing all of that. So in this instance, just for the sake of our demonstration, I'm, I'm going to ignore that <laughs> and, and just kind of move on with like the rest of the process, but just know that it's like, well, this would be a flag for me that it's like, Hey, I got to go back and fix that and then reprocess it, you know, later. So let's see the record. Uh, the red one will remove mesh. The pink one remove resolves mesh and the blue one will repair mesh. Oh, okay. That's okay. Well, that's good to know. See, I, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, okay. So then what I would do is like, w once I resolved whatever those issues were, I would just go back to export that and then call it you know, the same, the same name, Diane Archer or whatever, and hit save and then, and then continue. Okay. All right. So at this point, just for the sake of argument, we're going to say that this is our fixed mesh, right? So this is going to be ready to, uh, to put into the slicer. So what I'm going to do is go over here and we'll open up Chitu box. <clears throat> okay, so I've got this set for, uh, we'll just take a look at the settings real quick. Um, this is for my Frozen Sonic Mini 4K. Uh, with the Aqua 4K resin and Onyx settings. So when I go over here to print, these are my settings. I can take a screenshot of that or, or whatever, or you guys can screenshot it if you like. Uh, but these particular settings are kind of a combination. And ordinarily I don't print at, you know, layer height 0 0.5, 0 0.05 millimeter. Um, I usually like to print at 0.2. But if I do that, it increases the print time like by 
by four times like using this particular resin. And the reason why I'm using this resin right now, and I will show you what I've been doing uh, since we're talking about resin. Um, let's, let's look at that. There we go. Okay, so this is the this is what I've been doing uh, for the last couple of weeks. I've been experimenting and and uh, tr tr trying to find uh, resin properties that have uh, a flex to them a bit a little bit like styrene. So uh, over on Instagram and on I think one of the Warhammer printing groups or whatever, uh, Colonel Festus was posting about that he was using 8K uh, Aqua Gray on his 8K printers and mixing the Onyx Impact Plus. Uh, now, for those of us in the US, uh, the prices of these resin is about $40 uh, for one kilogram of aqua gray, and the Onyx is about $90. Uh, so the, the mix ratio on this is four to one. So what I've, I've done is I've measured out 32 ounces of aqua gray and eight ounces of Onyx at a four to one ratio, and put those in a 40 ounce bottle and mixed it up and I've had super great results with it. And what uh, I've, I've found is, is that it gives me a little bit of flexibility. So it's like, okay, so I've got this print right here. Let me see if I can get, get her to and get her in focus. So this is our little cat sniper character. Is it, is it gonna, can you see it? Oh, it's thinking. Okay, but the, uh, flex point on that see like if i was printing this with just aqua gray <laughs> this has been post cured okay so the reason that i've switched this resin is for this right here because if i was going to take this print and ship this out in a mailer it's going to be unlikely that uh that it's it's going to survive the um the the trip you know through the mail through the post so uh, so I've, I've had some pretty good results with that and like on thin, thin parts, like, you know, rifle barrels and like Walker legs and that kind of thing. So, um, so it's, it seems to be working pretty well at this point. Uh, now, uh, having said that, I'm also, uh, we just got our new, uh, 8k, our frozen, uh, Sonic mini 8k printers and I haven't even uncrated them yet uh, because I've been working on, you know, this other, the game stuff. So uh, as soon as I get those set up, I have a bottle of the, uh, I think it's, it's aqua. No, it's, it's ABS like. So, uh, oh, why are you wanting me to do that? Okay, <laughs> I think it's running out of memory. Uh oh. Can you guys still hear me? Did I, did I lose the stream? Did the stream drop? Wow, I think it choked. Can you guys still hear me? Or are you out there in the in the chat? <laughs> I think I've lost my camera. Okay, that that's fine. We'll go back to uh, we'll go back to Chitterbox. I, I'm showing that it's it's still 
It's still running. Okay. So, but that's not where I want it. So, let's see. Let me put you over here. Technical difficulties. Please stand by. All right. Didn't drop, but froze for a bit. Yes, we can still hear you. Okay. Okay, great. All right. All right, so I'm back in Chitterbox. It looks like I've, I've lost my camera connection, so I'm not sure what's going on with that. But anyway, um, you can you can still see my screen here. So and that's the important thing. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to import the, the STL file. So we'll go to the desktop, and where is she? There she is. There's our STL file. Okay, so we're going to open that up. All right, so there she is. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of position this so it'll be easy for me to put the supports on there. So I'm kind of rotate this around so that this is across here. Now, if you want some really, really good um, support, <laughs> put uh, tutorials on putting supports on there, go check out the 3D Printing Pro and um, uh, he's got some great videos and stuff on that. And that's where I basically got all of my chops for putting supports on models. So I'm just going to go through kind of the quick and dirty version of it. But there's a bunch of other detailed videos and so forth out there over on 3D Printing Pro's channel uh, that are super great uh, that have lots more detail. Um, okay. So we're going to go here and I need to, I need to stand her up and usually I'm just going to rotate this like 90 degrees. Okay. And then I'm going to, I'm going to tilt her back just a little bit and then reset that. But I'm going to save the project at this, this point and say, save project, all models. And it's going to be, uh, we'll just call her Diane Chittabox. Put that on the desktop. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to go back here, excuse me, <clears throat> I'm going to go back here and I want to rotate her back just a little bit in order to kind of break those 90 degree angles of the printing. So usually I run that between like 15 and 20 degrees. So now she's got kind of this angle that she's leaning back. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and open up the support tab and because I had heavy selected it created this raft object which I don't want so uh, let me select that and get rid of that raft oh D okay so there we go okay so that's that's what we're looking for so I've got medium supports selected and there's a whole bunch of little, and that's, again, that's why I'm going to kind of gloss over this part of it, because there's there's a whole bunch of different settings and so forth over here. And I don't really mess with those. I've got them set like I like them, <laughs> basically. Uh, but, and there's, it's, that's kind of out, outside the scope of, you know, kind of what we're doing here. Uh, but if you want more details about what all of the different um uh, attributes are for the supports and the rafts and the connection points and all of that sort of thing. There are, are additional other YouTube videos out there that, that cover that in more detail. Uh, I don't, all, all I want to do is I want to get enough supports on there that it's going to keep the model from moving and that it's going to support all of the, the islands and so forth so that it will print. Uh, but I'm sure there's probably a lot more um, uh, detail to, you know, if you really want to get in and, and start doing some, you know, super supporting or whatever. Uh, and basically just to start with, I'll just select the medium supports over here and then I'll just hit support all. And that's just going to give me a cursory place to start. Uh, but so you can see it's just added, hey, this is where I think those are going to go. Um, and depending on what these these little tiny supports in between places are I will go in and delete those and then I'll create another support for this particular area because you can see 
as the piece builds, there's an island right there. And these little islands are going to be, um, for, for those of you who are, are new to 3D printing and don't really quite understand how it works, um, the, the model is actually built like this on the, on the print plate. Okay, so like when you're looking at your 3D printer in this area, the vat of resin is going to be down in this area uh, underneath. Okay, so the build plate will be down. This is the, this is the build plate that moves up and down in the 3d printer. Okay. So this will move down into the vat. The light will shine up from the bottom up to the build plate where the resin is inside the vat and the light will shine there, cure the resin on it. And then it'll move up, you know, one layer at a time until it builds all of this. Okay. So then any, any of these little areas that are not supported, they won't print like they'll stick to the build plate. Right. Okay, so it's it's building, it's building, it gets down here, and then it gets to the gun barrel, and it's like, oh, wait, wait, wait. Hey, there's a little tiny sliver of stuff, so the light's going to shine on there. There's nothing holding on to it, so it's just going to stick to the build plate, and then it's going to keep, keep adding layers and stuff until it finally connects to here. Okay, but it's, then it's already, it's, it's not shining that light on it anymore because the stuff that's stuck on the, or I'm sorry, stuck on the FEP, the plastic on the bottom of the vat, it's not, it's not going to build anymore because it can't, it can't see anymore on there. So yeah, that's going to create a print failure. So this is, this is what we're doing now is trying to go and find all of those little areas and make sure that they're supported so that it builds properly. Okay. So there's one right there. There's one right there and there. Okay. So just to start off with, what I usually do first is, is put a, some reinforcements at the bottom of the model. So I'm going to go back to pick the, uh, the, heavy, the heavy supports, and I want to put like, I want to put a couple of them like at the heel, like here. Maybe one like right here, because there's already one that's kind of covering this area. And then that's just going to provide a little bit of extra support. Okay, so then as the piece builds up there, these are two separate, these are two separate objects at this point. As it builds off of the, off the build plate down to this point, it's gonna keep building and building and connect, bam, right there. And that's where it becomes like one piece again. Okay, so to keep these from like shifting around and wobbling back and forth, sometimes I will go and add a support here. There's already one here in order to keep that from shifting. Okay. And that's pretty much all you need because this is all going to be anchored down to the build plate now. Okay. So we'll take a look at the rest of the model and we're going to hunt down some more islands. Okay. So I'm going to select the light supports and probably go and like, there's an area kind of hanging off there. And that's probably not really going to matter too much. So we want to check these corners here and make sure that that builds. There's not any islands there. Check that pouch. Let's see. See, that's a big, big flat area. Sometimes I'll probably stick one right here just to kind of help hold that thin flat area as that, as that pouch builds up across there. And then We'll put a little support in this area, and it's even telling me there's one right there. So I don't want that to stick to the side. So I'm going to put it there. That looks pretty good. This is going to be supported. Let's see, I think there's something under here. Yeah, it's telling me there's one there. So let's see if, if I can put this one out here. And if I can edit that put it in that area. Will it let me move it? Yeah. So then I can move it into that area and now it's going to support as it builds across there and up into the sleeve. Right across there. Okay. So that's good. Let's see. That looks pretty good. 
Okay, we'll go ahead and take care of that gun barrel now. All right. I'm going to put that right at the end. Okay. So see that's that's a little that's going to be easier to remove than like this little spacer type of support right there. I think there was one on the the grip, the gun grip. Yep. So we're going to put one right there. That's kind of weird. Okay. Behind the knee where it's been. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll get back. I'll, that's that's a good point. I'll go back around and check that that leg again. So. Okay. Yeah, that's that's looking pretty good right there. Let's see if there's. Yeah, there's probably probably one there. And then I can go back over to the slider, and kind of check and make sure there's nothing, you know, hanging out on its on its own let's see okay let's check the back of that leg let's see we're looking around here looking around here that looks pretty good this seems to be this is kind of a flat area i may or may not need one there i can go ahead and put one and it couldn't hurt right and then usually at these really thin connection points that's usually a good place to, to put one too, even though the software won't find that on its own. So, you know, so I just used like support all as kind of like a, just a, a jumping off point. You know, it's like, well, hey, let me, let me see what it'll find. And then it doesn't take me as long to put, you know, like all of the supports on there, you know, because it'll, it'll do most of the heavy lifting and then I can just go back and, you know, check it manually before it, uh, before it's exported yeah that's the that's where i was thinking there was one other place uh, it's right around here yeah so okay so here again that's another case of let's let's put this one out here and see how that build, how it builds up yeah it's going to grab it. Bam, right there. Okay, so there's already a support as it builds out. And then it'll connect to under the jacket. So, yeah, that's a good spot right there, too. Okay. I think that's going to do it. I think that that's probably going to be enough. And then um, a lot of times what I'll do is go ahead and export this and run, you know, one of them just to test it and make sure that it's okay. And if I don't get any fails or anything on that, then uh, at that point, I will go back into the file and start replicating it. So I'm going to go back out here. Let's see, I'm going to save the project. I'm going to save all models, even though there's just one. And it's Diane Chitterbox and replace. Okay. So then I'll go across here. And I usually just start at this corner and just start replicating them you know, wherever they fit. I think I can get four across, or I mean four, four down. I was able to on the other one. This looks like that the raft areas on this are a little bit bigger, so I may not be able to get all four of them on there. Um, and then sometimes, depending on how they're oriented, you can rotate them around and try to fit stuff. It's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle, <laughs> trying to get the things to, to fit all on there. Uh, so I'm going to delete that. Let's just say that there's, there's three here. Uh, we'll kind of put those in this area. And then it's just a matter of instancing those across, you know, however many you want. I think I can put, let's see if we can get 12 on there. Let's see. What do we got? Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Then there's another little feature up here that you can hit and it'll center it and group them all together, but it kind of does this a lot of times and that's kind of a pain. So, you know, it's worthwhile just manually moving those around until they're, well, yeah, okay. One more. Put you over here. Okay, so I use, We'll usually try to find as many 
uh, fit as many of them on the build plate as I can fit on there. And we'll center those guys up. And we'll just say that, you know, okay, this is, this is it. That's it. So then it's a matter of hit the slice button. It'll go through the slicing process, which I, I don't know that we want to sit through that because like my computer is kind of slow. And so it's, uh, it, it would take it a while to slice that. So we'll just say at this point that we'll slice that. And then on the other screen, it, it uh, allows you to save your sliced file out. And that takes a while for, for it to write that file. Um, and uh, once you have that, then it's off to the printer. And so um, at this point, I usually give it another save just to make sure I've got all my changes <clears throat> saved in there. So, man, are you saving? There we go. Yeah. Yeah, my computer doesn't like to stream and run a lot of operations at the same time till I can get upgraded. Okay. So, we'll pop back out of there and there's see there's we've got all of our little files there. Okay? So, we've got our sculpt file, then we've got the files that I saved out for the different iterations of the sculpt, and then we've got our STL file. And then we have our chitter box file, and then we would have another file if I had actually sliced it and put it out. And that's the file that's going to go on to the flash drive. Okay, so then the flash drive travels from in here in the studio where I am, where you would actually, well, you probably saw me earlier in the, in the video. And then I would go over to our uh, 3D printing room where I was like, um, it used to be, well, it's still... Uh, molding and casting and that's where all of our 3d printers are and then it would I'd put that on the printer start it up and run it for however long it would take so I've got this little video that I put together and I want to run that for you um, and once I get finished running the uh, 3d prints I've set up my little wash and cure area in our uh, corner of the molding and casting room. So this is a process that I, I kind of go through and it's it's pretty efficient. I've, I use a three stage um, rinse on the, the prints. So, and I've tried to pare it down to where it's like, well, I only use like one paper towel and, I, and then I, I have one like leftover from the previous time. So I, I, I'm trying to save resources. Um, but I use these Rubbermaid kitchen buckets. They're, they're like a one quart bucket and it holds like one bottle of 91% isopropyl alcohol. Okay. So taking the build plate off of the printer, um, I usually just use the stock scraper thing that the printers came with and kind of work those off of the build plate directly into the alcohol. And you can see here in this first stage, I've, I've run a lot of prints on that and this alcohol needs to be changed out. Um, let's see. Uh, let me, let me check the chat real quick. Let's see. I want to, Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. I've, I've had, I've, I've printed a lot of stuff like in one sheet across the build plate before. Uh, it, it makes it a little bit hard, like my wash and cure process, it makes it a little bit more difficult to do that. And I wind up having to crack them apart in order to, uh, to rinse them. But, um, but I, I kind of like this three stage rinsing process because it's like, I've, I've seen reports from like, I, there was problems that Privateer Press had when they moved to printing uh, initially from the casting and so forth. And then um, uh, third party printers, I guess, you know, uh, there's been reports back that, uh, you know, they, that people have gotten uncured prints and so forth. And it's like, well, I don't want to send out any uncured prints. I want to make sure that, the you know, all of the raw resin and stuff is off of them. So, um so basically what I've done is, is in, in this process, 
I use this little, um, like a lab orbital shaker and I, I run the prints on there for about three minutes or two minutes and then, you know, scoop them out of the first rinse and then put them into a second clean tank. And, um, and that resin, like when I change this out and I dump the stuff in the first bowl or the, the first vat, um, uh, then I wipe that out, you know, clean it out and then transfer the stuff from the second vat into that and then put fresh alcohol in the second rinse. So it kind of cycles it through the process. Uh, but the little orbital shaker is really super handy for sloshing this stuff around. And I used to have to do that by hand, but now I can just put it on there and that allows me to kind of go and do other stuff while the prints are rinsing. And I usually do, like here I'm just doing one batch of prints, but usually there's like six or seven of them that are sitting around, you know, waiting for me to rinse them and, and you know, take them take the supports off. Um, but I, I <laughs> this process really beats the, you know, doing the injection casting that I was doing for, you know, the two-part resin, uh, just printing the direct prints. So then out of the second rinse, it goes directly into the water. And then that allows me to heat up another bucket. Uh, and I guess I could, I could rinse it all in one thing, you know, in hot water in order to take the supports out. But I really, I like to try and transfer it to another container because we don't have running hot water out here at the shop, but we do have a microwave. <laughs> so I take my little container of water and put it in the microwave while that's rinsing. And then the, I know the water is hot right when I take it out of the microwave. And then um, I let those prints sit for about a minute until they get soft. And then it's just like peel and eat shrimp, you know, at this point. So you can just go and pop the supports off of it. And, you know, the minis are ready. So it's, uh, this process is, has worked really quick. And you can see actually in the background where the casting tanks are, those little cardboard trays, those are, those are cat food, you know, case trays that I use as like a little project bin in order to keep, you know, projects together. Uh, but there's like five of them stacked up in the background and all of those are full of prints back there. So there's, there's like Edo scutter prints and there's bubble helmet collars and all that. Um, so once I get all those supports off, then those will go into the little cure uh, station here. And if, if you're interested in this, I got that as a kit, you know, on Amazon. And, um, uh, I run those for about four minutes or so on one side, flip them over and then run them for about four minutes on the other side. And then bam, that's ready to go. So <laughs> so, uh, then we've got here, let me go ahead and close that. <laughs> so, yeah. So then we get a, a cool little, a little print, you know, uh, and I'll, I'll show you. Let's see. I, I guess I don't have, yeah, I do have, I do have a picture of her. Uh, let's see. Let's go back to, let's see. Bomb right there with the water. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it, the little turntable in there. Yeah. It's, it's nice. I think I microwave it for about five minutes or so and it doesn't any, it doesn't even get anywhere near like boiling or anything. It's like, it's, it's just like, you know, hot water out of the tap. And so, um, so that's really, that's really handy. And you know, it's, it's good for about, I want to say, you know, seven or eight batches of, uh, prints and then it gets kind of gunky with, you know, there's like little particles and, you know, stuff floating around in there. So I, you know, change it out and put fresh water in there and, you know, try to keep that as clean as I can, because that's, that's actually the last rinse, you know, uh, that the prints will get before, you know, they go out before we ship them out. So, um, let's see. Oh Yeah. Let's take a look at this and I'll go back into our character folder and it's actually in here 
Yeah. Okay. So there, there's since my camera's not working, I have I have a printed one here, but um, there she is. <laughs> so, so that's that's the final print, uh, and it you know it it came out, and you know looking at it you know magnifying and stuff, you can kind of see a few little print lines and stuff on there. But like even when I'm looking at it, just magnified with my optivizer over there, once you hit this with a coat of primer, it's like, bam, I mean, that's going to take care of all that. It's going to be just like it was, you know, resin cast in a silicon mold. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why we've kind of gone to, you know, direct 3D printing for our miniatures instead of, um, you know, for uh, particularly for the smaller characters like this, where it's like, it's just faster for us to go directly to the printer with them and then get them ready to ship out. Um, we're still, we're still casting stuff, uh, in, in two part resin in, um, um, in yeah, polyurethane resin because, um, uh, it, some of the, some of the 3d prints, like some of the bigger items, like particularly like the, the Edo Strider, like the big models and stuff that we have, or like big busts. Yeah, you can print them hollow and, you know, I get that, but um, it, it would be cumbersome for us to, to run those prints. So it's easier for us to right now just print the smaller stuff and then still cast, you know, some of our bigger things, um, you know, at this point. Uh, I do have a bigger printer. I've got a, an Epax uh, E10, which is great for, you know, for printing, you know, big parts. It's like that's what we printed the, the rocket ship on and and that sort of thing so um uh, but anyway that's that's where we are and and hopefully um i'm going to be able to get the other the 8k printers set up uh this weekend or you know this coming week and try to start running tests with the uh the abs like uh resin in that and see how that comes out so i'm hoping that it's going to be as flexible. I don't know if there's any of you guys out there that have printed uh, using that particular resin. And if you have, uh, post in the comments or, you know, or, uh, or, or post in the chat right now, because we're still live for a little bit. Uh, your results and stuff from, from using that resin, um, because I'm, I'm, I'm looking for something that's going to be, you know, durable for the tabletop. That's, you know, it's not going to be brittle, particularly on thin parts and so forth, because um, I, I want to make sure that any of the miniatures that we ship out are going to be, you know, they're first of all, they're going to survive the trip, you know, through the post. And second of all, they're going to survive the tabletop, you know, right? Because it's like, you know, it's, it's one thing if you paint up a model and you spend a lot of time working on the mini and post-processing it, you know, and then you get it on the tabletop and then it gets shot, you know, it's like it's out in the first turn or, or the first round, you know, that's one thing, but, but it's another thing if you actually break the actual thing, you know, it's like, okay, well that, that would suck. You know, it's like, well, you know, cause you've spent all the time and, and, you know, making it look cool to put it on the table and, and then it's, it's broken. So, uh, and I've, I've dropped plenty of models here and we've got concrete floors in the shop and it's, it's no fun picking those pieces up. So, uh, yeah, so I'm still, I'm uh, right now I've, I've got a solution, you know, using the, uh, this, um, hybrid sort of, you know, aqua onyx mix, but the onyx resin is, is super expensive. I mean, uh, there were some other, uh, posts that I saw about, it's a uh, TGM seven, I think from Amera labs or t yeah, t t I think that's what it's called. Uh, let's see. Any cubic ABS is pretty good. Okay. I'm, I might have to look at the, at the any cubic and, uh, and try that too. Uh, I just wanted something that was going to, that was going to work well in our new frozen, you know, eight K printers. So, and I, and to me, it's, it's kind of weird. It's like labeling the resin as like 4k and 8k. It's like, I don't really know how much of uh, a f difference there is in those formulas. Uh, so I, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, but I'm assuming that the, um, the, the frozen, 
the ABS like is going to work, you know, just as well in the 8K printer as it would like in our 4K printer. But anyway, uh, but then the other holy grail uh, for that is going to be uh, clear resin. And I, I, I got a bottle of that when we got the new printers in too, uh, because I kind of want to test, you know, printing some of our, our bubble helmet domes and stuff like that in clear, clear resin. So let's see, let's, let's open this back up. And we'll, we'll take a look at a couple of things. Here. Come on now. Close that. And then, and you guys get to see like all kinds of cool folders and stuff. So let's see, yeah. Dome sprues. Yeah, so what I've done is I've kind of gone through um, the, the clear plastic bubble domes that we have for the, the bubble helmets. They're, um, oh, those are T8s. Yeah, let's see. Oh, no, those are, that's all of them. Wait, okay, here we go. We can go through. Yeah, there's the R10 domes. Okay, these R10 domes will fit on the R, R10 collars. Um, and these will fit on Primaris Space Marines. Uh, so that's like, if you're looking for bubble helmets to put on your Space Marines, these are the ones to get. Uh, let's see, R10 Sprues RFP, open, okay. So, so I've already sprued up the collars and we've printed a bunch of these already because I had, I had printed them before to make uh, silicon molds and we were casting them in, in two part resin. Uh, but I wanted to be able to take them directly to the 3D printer. So, uh, it, it, it kind of saves the expense of, of running the molds, in, you know, in silicon. And, and if, if the resin that we're printing these in is, is flexible enough that it's like, well, they're not going to, you know, break or snap off, you know, or whatever, then that's going to work. Um. So I sprued up these little domes and I want to try running these in clear, clear resin to see, you know, how well they print or if there's artifacts that appear on them or, or whatever. But uh, those domes fit on those collars right there. So then we can just start, you know, printing those out directly and sending out match pairs. Okay, so I set up a store over on um, Only Games to move our my mini factory files you know over to that and i contacted them and right now they don't offer clear resin as an option so anybody that is in with the sound of my voice of this live stream go over to only games and i'll put the link down in the description <laughs> if i if i can remember to do that i'll put the link down in the description go over to only games and say hey i want to print stuff in clear resin you guys need to offer that as an option because we have a lot of people in europe in the uk that want to buy these bubble helmets and put them on their space marine models and the shipping from the U.S. right now is just super expensive. I mean, just just a little package of these going out is like 60 bucks. And that's ridiculous for, you know, a tiny little package just going, you know, across the, the ocean. So, um, let's see, you could probably put that. Uh, this this sprue, actually, if you're talking about this because because of this right here, <laughs> let's see. These don't have that. These are the ones, these are the new ones that I made. And yeah, you could probably put that d just directly on the build plate with no supports necessary. Uh, the reason why this has supports here is that when I make the silicon mold for this part, I print this out and then I attach, I attach this sprue to another sprue with a hot glue gun. And then I build a mold box around that and then pour silicon into it and then when I take the mold box off I can turn that upside down pop that sprue off of the top and it's already got fill spots in that silicon mold for me to put the syringe down in there and fill these cavities with with resin 
so anyway, that's that's the purpose of that. Um, so, oh yeah, yeah, the bubble helmet one. Yeah, that I agree. It's like yeah, I, I should be able to take and just put that directly on the build plate. So that's that's what I'm hoping to do. It's like that's that's going to be my next. Well, one of my tests when I start running clear resin is going to be, you know, trying this part out to see you know how it comes up. Uh, Chambers of Minis. Patrick Chambers, thanks for dropping in, man. Thanks for sh showing up, sitting through the thing. I appreciate you jumping into the chat. Uh, yeah, yeah, I could. Uh, lower the pegs past the build platform. That's That would be another way to do it, sure. Um, let's see. Shane was talking about four 8k specific resins as a gimmick means nothing apart from curing details on the label yeah yeah see that's that's what i was thinking okay this is gonna this is gonna date me like going way back in the day but i remember when compact discs like music you know compact disc for music first came out right so the only thing before that was like you know uh cassette tapes and and uh, eight tracks and all that kind of thing right so as soon as digital audio became a thing there were like all of these companies that started repackaging their speakers and like, uh, uh, you know, rebranding their speakers as like digital ready and, you know, all of this kind of thing. And that's really funny to me because it's like, well, that's the same speaker there. You haven't changed anything. You know, it's, it's like, you know, <laughs> you're, you're having to market it to something that is unnecessary to me. It's like, well, it's a speaker. Of course it's going to work. You just, you know, plug it into the, thing and it, i don't know it's just that's that's always funny to me so i just assumed that you know 4k and 8k resin is something like that it's like well, hey use this with this printer and that sort of thing so yeah and i i, I don't know it's it that doesn't i just i just assumed that it probably didn't really mean very much so but uh anyway so yeah back in 1982 or 18 1882. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's like that show on uh, Paramount Plus, right? Back in the day. But, uh, but anyway, so, um, that's, that's really all I've got for you, for you guys this week. Um, and I am going to go ahead and kind of wrap up this particular live stream we're, we're just a little bit over an hour now so um that's not too bad it looks like the, the stream keeps dropping in and out a little bit so i know that i'm i'm eating up a lot of stuff here with these um having all these apps open and everything but uh anyway i certainly appreciate you guys you know sitting in this week and you know checking out the sculpting live show and we're talking about 3d printing and stuff and uh <laughs> an intentional title yeah yeah i i appreciate that thanks um but yeah i appreciate you guys you know coming and hanging out with me and you know sitting through the process of like this is this is how we make our bombshell miniatures you know uh here at the at the bomb shop and um uh next week i will probably be back to sculpting and zbrush i'm not sure what i've got to work on next but i know it's probably going to be one of the models uh, for the, uh, upcoming Kickstarter project that we've got for, uh, Counterblast. And, uh, cause in, on that, uh, on that project, we're going to release, uh, eight new miniatures. There's going to be four different alien types, archetypes, you know, for the role-playing game. And, um, there'll be a male and female version of each one. And I've already got the first two of those, uh, that are wrapped up. You guys can probably, scroll back through, you know, the, the Facebook posts or the, you know, on the Facebook groups or whatever. Um, but if you're so interested in, you know, checking out that project, or if you want to be notified when it launches, uh, that link will also be down in the description. Uh, and let's see, I think I've got like a little, a little promo of what it looks like. If, uh, let's see. There it is. Okay. So it's coming to Kickstarter March the 27th. 
and um, there will be a link there that you can be notified on launch whenever it gets ready to roll. So thanks a lot, and thanks for sitting in. And I've got a message here from um, ShopCat says, River dance on over to bombshellminis.com. She's very excited for you to check out all of our new releases and offers for March. <laughs>